Today is Sunday, January 1st, 2023, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. Some time ago, I, or I should say on a number of occasions in the past, I have spoken about uh, the practical use of the rule of St. Benedict. Many people think of the rule of St. Benedict and they think of monastic life, and they think, well, it must be a rule for monks and nuns, and it is. But when St. Benedict wrote the rule, he wasn't thinking, you know, I need to come up with a rule for monks and nuns. He was thinking, I need to come up with a rule on how to live the Christian life. That's what he was thinking. And so he had to start with principles of the Christian life and then apply them to a life of a man or woman who chose the religious state, who chose virginity or celibacy, I should say, for the sake of the kingdom of God. But his question was not, how should monks and nuns live? His question was simply, how should Christians live? And therefore, for those of us who are in the lay state of life, whether married or not, but you know, in, in, in my concerns married, since I'm primarily talking to um, married Catholics and, and parents, we should want to understand the principles of the Christian life, which St. Benedict started with, and look at how St. Benedict applies those principles to the life of men and women in the religious state and apply them practically to our own life as lay men and lay women in the married state. And recently I received an email from a a Catholic mother who was listening to one of those old talks and asked if I would take up this discussion of how we can apply the wisdom of the rule of St. Benedict to our own Catholic family lives. And in this talk I'd like to begin to do that. And so what what I'm going to do here and there as I move forward is take up a chapter or two from the rule, read through it, and then talk about how it might apply or the principles that can be drawn from it can apply to family life. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the second chapter of the rule of St. Benedict which is instructions for the abbot or abbess of a monastery, the head of the monastery. And before I get into this, let me also say this, that when St. Benedict sought to organize the monastery, he based the organization of the monastery on the organization and principles of the family. And he saw the monastery as a household that in many ways parallels the family. And so the applications of St. Benedict's rule to family life are actually quite easy because the monastic community that St. Benedict envisioned was itself based on the order of family life. So this is actually quite an easy reflection. So let's take a look at this second chapter of the Rule of St. Benedict and talk about how the instructions that he gave for the head of the monastic community apply and can be used to help us in family life. Now, I'm reading from a copy of an English translation of the Rule of St. Benedict that's available 
on the Benedictine website at osb.org, osb.org. And if you search around, you can find it online. This is from the second chapter of the rule. What kind of person the abbot or abbess, male or female, ought to be? What kind of person the abbot ought to be? And as we think about this, we can, we can reflect on what kind of person the head of the household ought to be. The rule reads, An abbot or abbess who is worthy to be over a monastery should always remember what she is called and live up to the name of superior. For she is believed to hold the place of Christ in the monastery, being called by a name of his which is taken from the words of the Apostle. In Romans chapter 8, quote, You have received a spirit of adoption by virtue of which we cry, Abba, Father. Therefore, the abbess ought not to teach or ordain or command anything which is against the Lord's precepts. On the contrary, her commands and her teaching should be a leaven of divine justice kneaded into the minds of her disciples. Let the abbess always bear in mind that at the dread judgment of God there will be an examination of these two matters, her teaching and the obedience of her disciples. And let the abbess be sure that any lack of profit, the master of the house, that is the Lord, may find in the sheep will be laid to the blame of the shepherd, that is, the abbess. On the other hand, if the shepherd has bestowed all her pastoral diligence on a restless, unruly flock and tried every remedy for their unhealthy behavior, then she will be acquitted at the Lord's judgment and may say to the Lord with the prophet, I have not concealed your justice within my heart. Your truth and your salvation I have declared, but they have despised and rejected me. And then, Finally, let death itself, irresistible, punish those disobedient sheep under her charge. This is chapter 2 of the rule of St. Benedict. Now, as I said, the application of this rule to family life is really quite easy to see. We can see that the monastery is to be compared to the household, and the abbot or the abbess is compared to the head of the household. And the head of the household, just because the abbot and the abbess may be male or female, remember that's because we're talking about a monastery for male monks and a convent for female nuns. So this doesn't apply to the father and the mother because the mother herself is subject to the head of the household, her husband. Now I know that in our generation this teaching isn't popular, but that's irrelevant because it's the truth. And I'm really not going to be concerned with any women who want to argue about the roles of 
husbands and wives or men and women. Um, if we don't agree on those things, you can just turn these talks off and carry on. But I'm, I'm speaking to those who I assume are not concerned with what our culture says or what is popular in this generation, but what the scriptures teach us, what God himself wills. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's all that matters. So when we read of the abbot or the abbess, we shouldn't think of this as the father or the mother, because the monastic community is not like the family. We should think of the abbot or the abbess being compared to the head of the household, which will be the husband and father of the household. Now what St. Benedict has to say, and remember the title of this chapter is what kind of person the abbess ought to be. And we can translate that to what kind of person the head of the household ought to be. And so we need to consider what the, what the mission is for the head of the household. The head of the household isn't just in charge of his own life. He doesn't just have his own career. And he's free to do whatever he wants. He's not free to command his family to do whatever serves his own ambition or career. But his authority over his household is received from the Lord. And he's to carry out the duties of the head of the household as his duties to the Lord, for which he is accountable to the Lord. And just as St. Benedict warns that the abbot of a monastery is going to have to give an account on Judgment Day for how he administered his role of authority as a shepherd of the monastery in the same way the head of a household has to understand that he is going to be required to give an account for how he administered his household as the shepherd of his family, serving again not for the sake of his own ambition and self-promotion, but as a servant of God, governing a household and directing the lives of his wife and children. And remember, when, whenever we talk about a shepherd or a pastor, the shepherd and pastor has a, a number of responsibilities. He doesn't simply command the sheep. He isn't simply served by the sheep. The sheep aren't simply slaughtered and shorn at his pleasure. If he doesn't care for them, he won't have any sheep. And the good shepherd is a shepherd who lays down his own life for his sheep. And if you've ever kept sheep or livestock, as I have, you'll know that trying to save money or save labor doesn't work. There's a certain natural balance between the profit received from the work of shepherding and that work. And if you try to exceed that, you end up with dead sheep. And the same thing is true in parenting. If a man tries to run a household, thinking of, thinking of it as... <clears throat> a sheepfold that he's just going to take from and use for his own pleasure, he's not going to end up with any sheep. But if he looks at his family as his own flock and realizes that the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep with Jesus as the model of a good shepherd he'll understand that he has 
obligations to fulfill, that he's not the owner of these sheep. He's merely a servant taking care of these sheep for his master. That's the true role of the head of a household. He's a shepherd. The shepherd was not the owner. The shepherd was a servant of the owner. God himself is the owner of the sheep, and we're merely his servants. <clears throat> so the head of the household needs to understand that the family is not his, but he is, in fact, a servant of the household, and his family members belong to God. And that he is going to give an account on Judgment Day for his care and management of the sheep. And St. Benedict says this judgment is going to be concerned with two things specifically. Two things specifically. First, the teaching that's provided that the sheep, as it were, were are taught and disciplined to do what they should do, to know what they should know. And secondly, the obedience of the sheep. The shepherd is accountable to God for the sheep. St. Benedict writes, Let the abbess be sure that any lack of profit the master may find in the sheep will be laid to the blame of the shepherd. Now this is where many parents get anxious. Because if you're a parent, you'll know that children aren't robots. We don't receive children and then simply type in the commands that they're to follow and they carry them out. They have their own independent will. Children can choose freely to despise and reject the teaching and commands of their parents. And the parents then often grow anxious thinking about this because they wonder, is this my fault? Am I guilty or accountable for my children's decisions and sinful actions? <clears throat> and the, the initial answer to that question is yes, of course you're accountable for your children's actions. You're their shepherd. So just think of it. If the master visited the farm, and as he approached the farm, he found sheep wandering out in the road, not being kept where they're supposed to be kept, would the shepherd be held accountable? for those wandering sheep? Absolutely. And the master's first thought when he saw these wandering sheep would be, where in the world is the shepherd? Why isn't the shepherd doing his job? That would be the master's first thought. This is, the, this is what the shepherd is for. He's to keep the sheep. And as I approach the farm, I find sheep wandering down the road. The head of the household most certainly will be held accountable for his wandering sheep. However, he will not be held accountable in some unconditional way or absolutely But he will be held accountable for whether or not he has carried out his duties, which are objective and measurable, 
and whether he has actually done all that the shepherd can do and should do, which would reveal that there were other causes of the problems with the sheep, problems that were beyond his control. And this St. Benedict speaks about. He says, If the shepherd has bestowed all his pastoral diligence, in other words, if the, if the shepherd is found to have done everything he was supposed to do for a restless unruly flock that he had a he had a bad flock of sheep and he worked as hard as he could and tried as hard as he could to control and keep them but it was impossible for him to control them and if he tried every remedy for their unhealthy behavior, that is, he exhausted every means available to him and took every pain that he could to fulfill his duty, the master would see and recognize that. And then St. Benedict says, he will be acquitted at the Lord's judgment. He will be acquitted at the Lord's judgment. So, are we as heads of households accountable for our children's behavior? The answer is yes. Are we to be condemned because our children wander from God's way, the answer is possibly. If we have not taken every pain, if we have not applied every remedy, if we have not done everything within our power, then yes, we will be accountable. And therefore, it's our responsibility and should be our, our goal to do everything in our power, to apply every possible remedy so that we can acquit ourselves when we stand before God and give an account for the management of our household. We have to make sure that we have done everything within our power to lead our family according to God's will. And if we're found making excuses or if we're found neglecting our duty and not doing everything within our power, then we have no excuses. And we're accountable. And so you can see the motivation is not that we would make our children all good because that may not be in our control. And I talk about this all the time. It may not be in our control to make our children do God's will. But we had better make sure that we've exhausted every means and remedy available to us in seeking to do so, in seeking to keep our family in God's will. And that's to be our focus. Our focus cannot be the end result because that's not entirely in our control. Our focus has to be on what is in our control and we have to make sure that we exhaust every resource, every instrument, everything available to us to fulfill this work. 
And these are very sobering words. And so you can imagine an abbot reading this and understanding that he would be held accountable by Christ for what happens to these monks who live in the monastery or the abbess who's given authority over the nuns in the convent. This is no joke. Our salvation is at stake as the heads of households. And we have to make sure that we fulfill these duties at every expense. This is why I hate this modern culture that urges young Catholic adults into marriage because this is dangerous responsibility. We talk about getting married and you hear young people saying, oh, they can't wait to to have kids. They want to have lots of kids. Who would ever say that? knowing the responsibility that parents bear for their children. What young man would ever say, oh, I just, I want to get married, knowing that he's going to be accountable for the life of his wife and children. If we understood the responsibilities of family life and how how serious they are, men and women would be much more reluctant to enter into married life. If, if I'm accountable to God spiritually for a wife and children that I don't have to have, but I can choose instead to devote myself to my own salvation and live a monastic life, why would I choose to take upon myself greater responsibility if it wasn't necessary to do so? And this is why I say I really hate how our generation urges young Catholics into marriage with no talk about this responsibility that the married state lays upon them. I entered into marriage before I even was a Catholic. I already had four children before I became a Catholic. I had none of this teaching. But as a 47-year-old who's the head of a, a large household, If I could go back and talk to myself as a 20-year-old, I would advise myself to choose religious life. Because entering into family life is very dangerous. And while I work and study constantly, constantly anxious about what's going on in my household, what my wife is doing, how she's doing, what she's thinking, what she's struggling with, what my children are doing, what they're learning, and whether I'm fulfilling my quote-unquote pastoral responsibility as the head of the household, I would never encourage myself to enter into this life as a young man. Because this is dangerous work for which we're going to give an account. You don't just make kids. These are never dying souls that are produced in marriage. And if we have no respect for that reality, we deserve the consequences. And we need to talk and think soberly about marriage and family life because it's not just getting hitched to your sweetheart and going and doing whatever you want for the rest of your life together, living out some romantic fantasy. It's becoming accountable 
for the souls in your household and for your responsibilities to each of those souls over which you, as the head of the household, are given authority. It's serious business. Now, I'd like to just talk about rhetoric for a little bit because it applies and I think it helps us to understand the role of the head of the household. When people think of rhetoric who haven't studied the art of rhetoric, they often think that rhetoric is the art of persuasion. And they think that rhetoric is some sort of rule book for how to persuade people. And if you learn the rules of rhetoric, you'll be able to persuade people. And this is not true. In his Art of Rhetoric, Aristotle teaches the exact opposite. Because of free will, because of free will, men are free to reject true arguments. They're free to reject good advice. They're free to despise the most beautiful speech or writing. And there's no way for any individual to force another human being into some course of action by means of persuasion. You can force someone by means of physical violence, but it's impossible to force someone to do anything by means of persuasion. And therefore, the art of rhetoric is, the, is not the art of how to make people do what you want them to do. That's not what it is. That result is not in our control. When we study Aristotle's art of rhetoric, we learn that the goal of studying rhetoric is to learn all of the available means of persuasion. All of the available means of persuasion. Because our duty in speaking is not to cause a result in another person, but simply to employ all of the means of persuasion available to us in our speaking or writing. It's to simply exhaust all of the available means of persuasion. So if I was to judge the quality of a man's speaking or writing, I wouldn't look at his audience and judge it based on their reaction because they could be an evil bunch of people. They could be a bunch of irrational, emotional wackos. And he could speak to them the clearest truth with the most persuasive proofs, and they scoff at it because they're corrupt. I wouldn't look at the audience to judge a man's speech. I would look at the art of rhetoric and ask, what means of persuasion are available to this speaker and which of them has he employed? Which of them has he neglected? Which of them is he ignorant of? That's what would be used to judge the speaker. Not the response of his audience, but whether he has employed all of the means of persuasion available. To him. The same can be illustrated in the practice of medicine. If a sick person goes to the doctor, the doctor's responsibility is to try to discover the cause of the sickness or disease or pain or whatever the trouble is. The doctor's duty is to discover the cause and then to try to remedy that cause, to remove the cause. 
The doctor is not judged for whether or not he actually brings the person back to health because that may not be in his control. He is judged based on whether or not he knows of and employs all of the available means of healing. So he would be judged not by people in the street, not by his patients, but he would be judged by other physicians who know of all of the means of healing available and whether or not they had all been employed and exhausted. So that if the patient doesn't recover, and we were to look and ask, why has the patient not been returned to health, we would look and examine what the physician has done to try and restore health and see whether all of the known means of healing have been employed. And you can imagine that a more expert physician might know of 10 possible means of healing of a certain condition, whereas an inexperienced physician might only know of two. And the more experienced physician would look and say, you've only attempted two of the means of healing in this, in this situation. What about the others? And that's how a physician is to be judged, the same way that a speaker or writer is to be judged, not by looking at the patient, not by looking at the audience, but by looking at the art itself and whether the practitioner of that art has exercised all that that art makes known to him. The same is true in parenting. We cannot judge a parent by the behavior of his children because they can reject good parenting. We judge the parent by whether or not he has taught them all that Christ has commanded, whether he has made use of the available means of instruction and discipline and correction and so on. We judge the parent by the art of parenting as it was not by the results, which are not in his control. And so we're warned here in the rule that the head of the household is going to be judged not by the results of his children, which are not in his control, but he's going to be judged as to whether or not he has worked and studied and prayed and labored to discover and employ all of the available means in the care of his wife and children. That's what he's accountable to. And if the shepherd has bestowed all his pastoral diligence on a restless, unruly flock and tried every remedy for their unhealthy behavior, then he will be acquitted. And St. Benedict says, he will be able to say, as the prophet of the Old Testament said, I have not concealed your justice within my heart. Your truth and your salvation I have declared. But they have despised and rejected me. Our goal as heads of households is to see to it that we can say that on Judgment Day. I have not concealed your justice, your truth and your salvation I have declared, but they have despised and rejected me. That's the goal in the life of the head of a household. And if we don't work to employ every available mean of instruction and training and modeling of the behavior and correction of bad behavior, if we haven't exhausted every means, 
then we cannot say that. We will not be able to say that and will be accountable. So being able to say that is our goal and that's in our control. We need to study to know all of the art of parenting, as it were, the art of household management, as it were. We need to study to know all that we're to teach our children. We're to study to understand how to manage the behavior of our children. And we're to labor constantly like a shepherd for sheep to keep all of our children as far as lies with us, as far as we're able. And so I hope that you can see here that applying the rule of St. Benedict to family life is really quite simple. It's very helpful too, because even having the the monastery as a model to compare and think of, think of similarities is helpful for us in family life. And many of these things get distorted, especially in modern, in this generation where there's this obsession with trying to appear masculine among men, this idea of, of, of masculinity where a man wants to command his wife and children and have them serve him as you know as if the end of the family is his happiness and prosperity or well, that's not the role of the head of the household yes a wife is commanded to obey her husband and children are commanded to obey their parents but those commands of obedience are no more binding than the commands on the head of the household to provide for his family, to teach his family, to discipline his family, to lead his family, and so on. We can't separate these commands. They always have to be kept together. And the minute any of them are neglected, the whole thing unravels. And what we see in modern society is that for many families, the failure of the head of the household to perform his duties has caused the whole household to unravel, the whole culture of family life to unravel. And that extends into religion because true religion takes family life for granted. Because family life itself is not based on religion. Family life is understood by means of human reason. Even the pre-Christian pagans understood true household management. You can read Xenophon on household management, and a Greek who lived four centuries before Christ, who explained how a household should be ordered. This isn't, this isn't secret Christian knowledge. This is simple, natural human understanding. And so for this first talk, let's draw from the rule the solemn responsibilities of the head of a household to teach and keep the sheep of his household, knowing that he's accountable to God for their welfare and that unless he exhausts all of the means available to him, he's going to be held accountable for any lost sheep or any to, to keep the illustration of the of the chapter here to to explain any loss of profit for the master in the keeping of his flock. So let's reflect on that and and amend our lives and put this advice into practice because if we're not going to put it into practice we're wasting our time collecting information that's just going to condemn us. So let's put this into practice and work to apply the rule and its principles to our family life. And we'll continue to read through and reflect on the rule of St. Benedict 
throughout this year as, uh, as time allows, um, as other topics are, are dealt with at the same time. But I, I intend to, to go through the rule of St. Benedict and try to draw out these principles and apply them to family life. I hope that's helpful. God bless.